Hello, I'm Pastor Harmon Lewis from Messiah John's Creek. So far in this chapter, we have talked about how God created the angels to be his mighty ones to do his bidding. We learned how some of those angels sinned against God and became what we now know as the devil and the demons. We then talked about how the devil tempted Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, thus leading them into sin. And we talked about the tragedy that resulted, the immediate consequences that Adam and Eve had to suffer. Well, in this lesson, things are fixing to get real personal because we're going to be talking about the consequences, the effects that sin still has on us today. When God created Adam and Eve, we're told that he created them in his image. Now, this doesn't mean that Adam and Eve had the eye color or hair color or any other physical features of God. What this means is Adam and Eve were created to be perfect. However, after the fall into sin, we read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After the fall into sin, children no longer have the image of God. That is, they're no longer perfect. Children inherit the image of their parents, meaning they inherit sin from their parents. We call it original sin or inherited sin because just as parents pass down physical features like eye color, hair color, or height, or any other physical feature, they also pass down something far more devastating. They pass down sin to their children. When exactly is a child sinful? Well, we read in Psalm 51.5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We are sinful from the very moment we are born. Matter of fact, we can even back up the birth canal a little bit. We are sinful from the moment we are conceived. When a sinful sperm and a sinful egg come together to create life, that life is sinful. One of the consequences of sin that we continue to deal with today is that all people are born sinful. Years ago, a friend and I went to go visit the Grand Canyon, and I was blown away by what I saw. This thing is a hole in the earth that is like a mile deep and 10 to 20 miles wide. Now, I mentioned the Grand Canyon to you because in Romans 3.23, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One of the effects of sin that we still deal with today is we fall short of the glory of God. I want you to imagine that Grand Canyon. I want you to imagine that you're going to try to jump across that Grand Canyon and you run as fast as you possibly can. And you jump as far as you possibly can jump. Let's say that you jump 25 feet. But still you're several miles short and so you plummet to your death. Now let's say the world's greatest long jumper gives it a try. And they run as fast as they can and they jump as far as they can. Let's say they jump 50 feet. Still, several miles short, and so they fall and plummet to their death. Now, let's say for whatever reason, you have an ability to, to jump farther than any man or woman has ever jumped in human history. And you, you run and you jump, and let's say even some wind blows up beneath you, and for some strange reason, you're able to jump one mile. You're still nine miles short of the other side of the canyon, and so you, you fall and you plummet to your death. One of the immediate consequences of sin is we fall short of the glory of God. So no matter how good we are, even if we're better than all the other people on the planet, we still fall short. We still deserve to plummet to our death. A consequence of sin that we still, still deal with today is mankind falls short of God's holy demands. For many years, I served as a pastor along the Gulf of Mexico, 
And close by the church where I served, there was a Coast Guard base. And so quite naturally, I got to know a lot of the men and women in the Coast Guard. And I have a great deal of respect for all of them because the, the men and women of the Coast Guard, they're in the people-saving business. You see, they don't teach the, the people on the boats or the people flying the planes or the rescue swimmers. They don't teach them how to give inspirational speeches. They don't teach them cheers. The people in the Coast Guard, they don't, they don't pull up to a sink, ship that is sinking and yell over, you can do it, you can do it. And the rescue swimmer doesn't yell down from the helicopter to the person drowning in the waters below, swim harder, swim harder. No, they go and they rescue those people because the people cannot save themselves. Another consequence of sin is we cannot save ourselves. I'm going to read a longer section of scripture to you from Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. And as I read this section of scripture, I want you to imagine that God is speaking directly to you because God is describing the situation that you are now in because of sin. We read in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Because of sin, we cannot save ourselves. As a pastor, I talk with people and help them through all the various stages of life. And, and one of the things that we all deal with eventually is death. And whether that's death of a child that we believe died too soon or, or death at the hands of disease or cancer, death of a grandparent, death of a parent, or maybe even as we start to contemplate our own death. There's a certain uneasiness or anxiety or maybe even a fear about death. And I would say that's natural. That's okay. Because you see, we weren't created to die. We were created to live. And yet we read in Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. We die because we sin. Romans 6.23 puts it rather simply. For the wages of sin is death. Because we sin, death is now in the world. God created mankind to live for all eternity in perfect harmony with Him. But sin changed all that. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we read, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Sin has separated us from our God. Because of sin, we no longer deserve to spend eternity with Him in perfect harmony. Now, because of sin, we deserve damnation. Because of sin, all mankind deserves to be damned. In today's lesson, we have seen how devastating sin is. 
we inherit sin from our parents and we pass sin on to our children. And because of sin, we fall short of God's holy demands. Because of sin, we're unable to save ourselves. And because of sin, we die. Because of sin, we deserve to be damned. The consequences, the effects of sin that we still deal with today are devastating. But in our next lesson, we get to talk about God's grace. I highly encourage you to join me for that lesson.